Our next talk is called, What's the Best ROI of International Development Talent? How to Make a Difference with Your International Development Career. And our speaker today will be Joan Gass. So Joan recently graduated from a three-year dual degree program from the Harvard Kennedy School and uh, Stanford Business Schools. Um, before graduate school, Joan helped start Bain & Company's office in Nigeria and founded an NGO in Uganda that helps the government scale evidence-based programs and make data-driven decisions. Joan has been involved in effective altruism community building across Stanford and Harvard, including launching a new initiative at the Kennedy School to leverage policy to mitigate emerging technology risks, launching an EA career fellowship for policy students, and co-organizing a retreat for Boston leaders. Please join me in welcoming Joan. Hi, folks. Um, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, so uh, when I started at the Kennedy School, I was in an international development specific policy program. And I um, went up to our program facilitator um, at the beginning of the program and started talking to him about career decisions. And this is what he said to me. <laughs> he had some like really strong thoughts about policy careers, options, and what he thought was kind of like the highest impact thing to do. And so um, some caveats before I begin this. So I wrote this paper um, for my global development thesis. Um, did, did it over like a three to four month period. Um, it is specifically for students that are thinking about global development, public policy careers. Um, as a result, it doesn't contain the spectrum of all things we talk about within effective altruism. So in particular, it doesn't really take into consideration long-term thinking. It's not really looking at animal welfare. Um, it's just kind of targeted towards the audience of my peers um, within the program that I was, I was working in. Um, and also, I don't think it's exhaustive. Um, I chose a couple examples of cause areas within global development to try and be illustrative of, of a methodology that I was interested in exploring, um, but it's not an exhaustive search. So um, why does it matter what one chooses to focus on within global development? Um, I think we've seen a couple examples of things that people have done within the global development space that have just been complete home runs. Um, so you know, there was someone that invented a key strain of wheat during the Green Revolution that saved between 10 million, maybe up to a billion lives. That really mattered. Um, eliminating smallpox averted one and a half million to two million deaths per year. Um, and there's some research that shows that four out of five Haitians who um, have emerged from extreme poverty have done so because they've immigrated out of Haiti. Um, so those are some examples of things that we might consider home runs from a policy perspective um, or thinking about global development. At the same time, there have also been things that have been really negative for the world. So for example, Brazil had an economic slowdown in the 1980s, and that resulted in the current um, net present value loss of seven and a half trillion dollars worth of value. So, some pretty big variants here. Um, and when thinking about how we can decide cause prioritization, I took the classic kind of effective altruist um, impact, neglectedness, and tractability, and tried to um, adjust it towards metrics that I would be able to apply to the global development space. So I'll just run through um, how I thought about using each of these metrics in the context of my thesis. Um, so neglectedness is about how many people are currently, or how many people or resources are currently working on this issue. Um, I use proxies related to World Bank funding um, with some modifications to think about how much money was going in this space. And then I also did a survey of alumni a couple years out in my program to think about how many um, people were working on a given issue. Um, when thinking about impact, um, I look to see um, how much improvement in human well-being might there be if this problem was solved. And when thinking about tractability, and I think this one is one of the fuzzier ones to measure, um, I did expert interviews, looked at historical examples, and when I was still unsure, I did a threshold analysis, which I'll give an example of later, which was like what percent confidence would I have to have to think that this was a good thing to make a bet on, and then tried to see was I above or below that threshold, or did I have enough analysis um, to, to kind of put me on one side of that coin or the other. Okay, so answer first. Um, what did the recommendations end up being? So of the universe of options that I ended up looking at, I ended up recommending people focusing on new modalities to foster economic productivity. New modalities are ways to think about states developing capabilities, um, thinking about global catastrophic risks, particularly pandemic preparedness, um, and kind of a 
area around meta research, so the importance of more people doing cross-prioritization within global development. Um, I'm gonna go in depth to the economic productivity one, so I'm just gonna skip over that for now and talk really briefly about these last two just to kind of give you a flavor for what I did during my thesis. Um, so one of the reasons why I emphasize um, pandemic preparedness is because from an impact level, um, pandemics in general disproportionately impact uh, developing countries. You can think of like how Ebola impacted Liberia, um, but also there's a decent amount of evidence and predictions, um, one that I cited in my thesis by Larry Summers that talk about how the annual cost of the expected pandemics in the next couple of years, uh, the expected uh, future projections around pandemics are comparable with a range of outcomes we would see on climate change in terms of um, negative, human, negative implications on human well-being. Um, the limited, there's like a pretty limited amount of funding currently going into this space, particularly on the tail risk scenarios that we often talk about with NEA. Um, and then I think there's like a lot of potential for this to be tractable. Um, this isn't a fun fact, but an interesting fact was uh, right after, so um, OpenFill helped fund a study on the blue ribbon panel, which had to do with evaluating what US policy and security was around. Um, thinking about pandemic preparedness, and a couple days after, before this study was released, um, live anthrax was accidentally shipped across the country. So it looks like that there are like kind of tractable things we could be thinking about on this issue. Um, in terms of the meta research, um, some additional areas that I would have loved to go into if I had more time, we're continuing to investigate kind of like what is this ADK approach for global development, what could it look like, um, I didn't really get to dig into cause areas that I think are really promising, like immigration, um, improved security in low-income areas, like theft and insecurity is one of the top drivers of suffering in like um, low-income urban areas. And I didn't get to dry, uh, like dig into things like gender-based violence, which is like one of the biggest uh, drivers around violence around the world. So definitely a lot more research to be done if folks are interested in this. Um, I ended up, okay, so we've talked about answer first things that I recommended. In terms of things that I was either kind of medium about or didn't end up recommending in the thesis. Um, so I ended up kind of at the medium state around global health, which might be kind of surprising for an EA audience. Um, the reason for this was I think global, like addressing global health problems is, cl is clearly like highly impactful. There's a lot of work left to do. Um, from a neglectedness like standpoint, it's like not quite as neglected from a funding perspective. Um, so maybe the like additional marginal person that has innovative ideas might matter slightly less than some of these other cause areas that are both high impact and tractable and uh, more neglected. So that was the thinking there. I think that this is like still a pretty solid bet and it kind of depends on your position, but just kind of wanted to take that into account. Um, and then clearly very high in terms of tractability because we have a lot of historical examples around wins in this space. Might be another reason to do it, look at global health, particularly if you're more risk averse with your career. And then areas that I didn't recommend. Um, we'll talk about this more. I think there's a distribution in all these areas, but um, I ended up not recommending, particularly for people in my program, to think on balance about going into social entrepreneurship. I kind of define this, there are lots of definitions, as like individuals trying to sell a product that have a double bottom line. Um, one of the reasons for this and where it's clear is like I think situations in which you're displacing a government from providing a public good can have longer term implications. So one example of this is um, there was a social enterprise in India that was providing private clean water for rich households in urban areas. And what that did was took away public demand for systems change to provide clean water to the entire neighborhood, including like lower income households. So I think there's like particular concerns with this model when you're thinking about monopoly provided services. Um, but in general, I think there are also concerns within my program, folks were like really rigorously trained in economics and data analysis, and I'm not sure if social entrepreneurship is like their comparative advantage or what they're uniquely positioned to do. Um, and I think we might have overemphasized it a bit related to prestige and status. I did like some analysis of um, echoing green fellows and likelihood of success, and it was like lower than a lot of my peers thought in terms of 10 years out. It's a, um, a venture firm that um, funds social entrepreneurs. 
Um, and so these, these made me like a little bit hesitant on average to recommend it. Um, and then another one that is, um, I think, potentially uh, an area in which there might be some back and forth is the question around the benefit of running additional RCTs. Um, and so in this uh, particular area, um, I was interested not just in the value of RCTs in general, but the value of an additional marginal person working in this space. Um, I imagine that you know, in any given space, there's a variance. So I think like there's probably really high value if someone had a longitudinal study around the long-term effects of deworming. We'd like pay a lot of money for that, and like I would really love a person to do that. But the question is like for an average person entering the space, running an average RCT, what do we think the additional value is? Um, and I kind of came to the conclusion that um, the value of information of research might not be uh, super strong um, for RCTs in particular because of considerations related to external validity. We might get higher value research from some of these macro level um, issues that we could focus on and also from looking at systems change work or diagnosing administrative and political constraints. There's a whole section of my thesis and I could take all 20 minutes to talk about that point, but I'm just gonna acknowledge that it's a hot take with an EA for now and I'm happy to talk more about it later. <laughs> um, yeah, so one way to summarize this is to say within the global development community, we've thought a lot about service delivery that's not at scale, so like what do we think about vocational training or cash transfers or things within an NGO context? And a lot of what I ended up recommending within my thesis is that there's higher expected value to thinking about how do we move from service delivery not at scale to service delivery at scale? How do we look at iterations to make service delivery at scale happen in the first place? And how do we think about facilitating larger economic growth? So not only the macro conditions at scale, but also the ma macro conditions at scale. Um, and um, one way to think about this is that the way we've been thinking about um, approaching global development um, has been thinking about marginal improvements in the global development space, um, and I'm advocating for something that might look more like a hits-based approach to global development. So there, are, this diagram is a little crazy. There are two overlapping graphs, so I'll just explain it here. Um, so we have like a risk return analysis here, which means uh, things that are higher here um, on this frontier have a higher chance of return, but also potentially a higher variance about whether or not they succeed. And one of the things I argued is that we've had a lot of value in the global development space, thinking about in the micro space, getting better bets. So, you know, I think that there's on average a decent amount of evidence that shows that some of the benefits we thought with microfinance with causal identifications aren't as strong as something like give directly. And so we've like definitely pushed the efficiency frontier forward here. But what I'm also arguing is that there might be certain things like economic growth that have a wide variance of outcomes, but and some of these things aren't gonna work at all, and some of these things we might knock out of the park. And if we focus on these higher variants, we might overall have a higher return. So that's kind of one argument within the thesis. Okay, so let me go, I've talked a little bit about economic growth as an illustration of this, so I'll just go in depth to this um, for one or two minutes. So as I was thinking about economic growth, um, I was thinking about analyzing the impact at stake. Um, so if you look at um, accelerations of economic growth, times when countries have really taken off compared to what we expected them to do, it's created $20 trillion of value. To put that in context, that's the current annual GDP of Nigeria times 60. So this is like a really significant amount of value that's on the table if we could figure out how to foster these growth accelerations or extend them. Um, I think that this is an area where like questions around neglectedness are debated. There's a decent amount of general World Bank funding that's going into economic growth, but there's a pretty limited amount of funding that's going into like more novel or innovative methods to thinking about economic growth. And those are the areas that I'm like much more interested in and think there's a lot of value in. And then there are huge debates within economics about whether or not this is tractable. Like is it even possible to foster economic growth or is it not? Um, within my thesis, 
I tried to provide some examples to argue for why I thought it was tractable um, and why there were new methods that I was really excited about around economic growth. This unfortunately fuzzy diagram is an example of a growth diagnostic in um, Nepal and what it shows is that um, there are ways in which you can try and identify the binding constraints or what the bottleneck is for economic growth to take off in Nepal. And there was kind of a bunch of different folks within the government and the private sector saying that once they had this diagnostic of what the challenges were, they were able to focus political capital, administrative capital, and resources in order to try and unlock that. And I think this is an example of a methodology that could be potentially really high impact. Um, another thing that I did is, you know, had conversations with people and was like, I think economic growth might be high potential, but I'm like, not sure if we have enough like if we're confident enough for any given try, if it's worth it. So I did some analysis that was like, how much money would it cost to try out one of these things? And how much value do we think we would get from it? And like, what's the difference between doing that and just giving the money to give directly? And basically came up with this analysis that, was, that said that if we have a 2.5% chance that we can get something right in terms of economic growth, the example I was using here was a 0.1% growth um, in GDP in Ethiopia that lasts five years, if we are at least 2.5% confident that that's correct, then it's worth a $5 million investment because that's the equivalent amount of value we would get of like donating $193 of value to give well um, in terms of expectation. So then my question here is, do we think there's a 2.5% chance that we could actually achieve this outcome? And I think that's where you could do further research around case studies and expert interviews to try and interrogate that question. Oops. Okay. So, finally, um, I think there's a question of like, what do we do with all of this? And at the very end of my thesis, I tried to recommend like, what might you do next? If you've gone through this analysis, maybe you've arrived at similar conclusions to me, maybe you've used the same methodology and arrived at different conclusions from me. Um, and I think that there's potentially a four-step process that you could go through. Um, so the first step that I recommend is, oops, okay, to develop your impact hierarchy. So I think what this looks like is um, you're cause neutral. You think about using something like impact, neglectedness, tractability. What do I think are the most important problems to work on? And you rank them. I think as an individual, especially in the global development space, you should take into account your um, nationality because I think that gives you specific leverage on issues, especially if you're thinking about government work. Um, this is just an illustrative example. This is not like my particular uh, cause prioritization, but I think it's like one example of uh, what an impact hierarchy could look like. Um, and I think you should take into account your nationality, but I think you should otherwise try and be cause neutral. So neutral about like the pathways that you think about, neutral about your preferences. And then I think you should try and like map out your personal fit. So maybe, for example, for this person who might be from India, hypothetically, in my example, um, they feel really excited about microfinance in India, um, and it's like something that is like within their core competency they've done before. Maybe they uh, think like biosecurity is really important, and being in the U.S. to do that is super important. But that's like outside of where their personal fit is because they want to be close to family. So that might be an example of personal fit, location, skills, and interests, and where they overlap with areas within their cause prioritization and where they don't. And then the next step that I recommend is to test the highest impact option. And you could choose to do like test the highest impact option that overlaps with the two, or maybe if you're in grad school, maybe if you have some free time, maybe you have some runway, you try and test an option that's like just outside your boundary to think about like, is this an area that I could stretch to? Is this an area that I couldn't? And I think that these all allow you to get more data about whether you're a good fit. Um, and then the last thing that I think you can do once you have one of these areas that you've narrowed down in is um, you can backwards engineer how to have a lot of influence in that area. So you can look at people who have been really successful in that field, really influential, and think about their career paths. Ideally, you have a variety of career paths. And then you can think about what your next steps might be to get to an area where you have a max amount of, maximum amount of influence um, in that in that field. So you can download the paper at this bit.ly <laughs> um, if you want to see it. 
uh, warning is that it's 50 pages long, but I also have a uh, four-page policy overview. Um, and I would like really love comments and feedback. Um, I think this was an attempt to me to like take some methodologies that we talk about within effective altruism and cause prioritization and apply them to a field where I, ha I had a background in and an academic opportunity to reflect on. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done still in this area. Okay, so just a quick reminder again that we do have um, the opportunity to have some um, Q&A from the audience during the end of the session, so please submit your questions on Visibo. Um, our discussant for this evening will be James Snowden. So James graduated from the University of Oxford in 2011 with a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics and holds an MS in philosophy and economics from the London School of Economics. His previous experience includes uh, several years working as a strategy consultant and a researcher at Giving What We Can and the Center for Effective Altruism. He currently works at GiveWell as a senior research analyst where he's investigating giving opportunities related to policy. Please join me in welcoming James. Does this work? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes it does. Great, thanks so much, Jane, for a really interesting talk. Um, I think I'll just give a very brief summary, not going more than one minute, about what I took from the talk, um, and then I just think it's probably best if I just ask you some questions um, you know, about what further research you'd do, or, or kind of, you know, anything that you would particularly want to highlight. Um, so Joan analyzed a number of different options for smart graduates um, working on international development for an importance, neglectedness, and tractability framework. Uh, she concluded four areas looked particularly promising. So new ways to foster economic productivity, new ways to develop state capabilities, uh, global catastrophic risks, in particular pandemic preparedness, and meta-research on talent in global health and development. It's always good to find your own uh, paper, <laughs> one of the most important things. Um, so then Joan also outlines a practical four-step process to choosing a career. Uh, so first, determine which areas you think are most important to work on. Uh, second, identify your own personal fit. Um, third, challenge yourself with the highest impact option, um, pushing the boundaries of your personal fit, which I think is very important. And fourth, develop a plan to uh, reach maximum influence on the issue. So I think, uh, Joan, your talk does a really great job of surveying a number of promising areas um, and developing practical heuristics for making good decisions about your career. I think kind of my first question would be, um, if you were kind of someone sitting in this room and you were thinking, okay, this was interesting work, um, I want to take your research, I want to build on it, I want to make it more robust, or I want to expand the scope. Um, what kind of questions would you be asking and what do you think the most practical way to, to do that would be? Yeah, um, so I think that there are additional ways that the methodology could be more robust, right? Like I, I used a couple proxies um, that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So, you know, I, I use World Bank funding as a proxy for all global development funding. You could do a more precise estimate of that. I was looking specifically at graduates from my program. Those might be more or less representative for like the graduates and talent of people in public policy. So there's definitely more methodological depth. Um, but I also just think there are a lot of additional areas that I didn't have scope or capacity to explore. Um, so not only like more approaches to people doing this meta research, but I mentioned some stuff on like migration and violence that I think would be particularly interesting to explore further. Great, and then you, you kind of you mentioned a few kind of case studies as examples of, of some of the areas you were looking into. Um, I was particularly interested in in the kind of case studies on, on growth growth episodes you mentioned, and and in particular, you know, whether there are examples of particular organisations that might have played a causal role in in the story there, which kind of might you know make us think about where where we could have an impact yeah. ourselves. Um, so in, in principle, I think there's a lot more high value research to be done in growth. I think that there's like a lot of really interesting research around what causes growth episodes to take off. I think there's also really interesting research to be done when you have a state that's going from like a fragile or conflict zone to something that's more stable, how, to, how that can happen well. Um, I don't know if we're ever gonna be able to causally show like if this individual or organization led to growth. But some interesting examples that I was looking at and would have continued to look at in my thesis if I had time is um, the Korean Development Institute is a really interesting example of like a think tank that helped Korea develop a growth strategy that people have looked at in the, um, in the 1980s. Um, there's also something similar in Indonesia where a group of like PhD economists um, help advise the government. Some of them were nationals of the government. Um, but I think we have a couple historical examples that at least point to ideas of 
smart folks thinking about economic growth policy with policy input at the right time could be really promising in this area. Got it. Um, and then kind of last, last question from me and then I'll hand over to the audience. So, so you mentioned some kind of new approaches for state capabilities and economic growth and you kind of separated that from, from the old approaches. So I, I guess I'm curious, you know, other examples of particularly promising new approaches maybe that, you know, over the last 10 years which we might not know about and which you think you know, might be particularly good areas to work in, um, or was this more related to, well, we, haven't, we don't really know what the right approach is yet. We need to work that out. Yeah. Um, so I think there's value in both. Some of the things that I was particularly interested in within the economic growth space were this growth diagnostic approach, that fuzzy diagram that ended up in my paper. Um, the Center for International Development um, does uh, work on this. Um, Millennium Challenge Corporation does as well. This idea of being like, we're not just going to do everything that we think promotes growth, but often the binding constraint is political capacity and feasibility. So we're going to target the thing that we think is the most binding on growth. I think it's a really interesting way to think about maybe why some of this work has had a mixed track record in the past and try a new approach. On the um, state capabilities or like governance and delivery mechanism front, um, I think there's a lot of really interesting work around facilitated emergence. So historically, there's been kind of like a bunch of people will come in, they'll do like a weekend or week-long training and then they'll leave and like suddenly everything isn't fixed. And I think there's a lot of really interesting questions of how do you foster kind of like local talent, decision making, um, how do you build on the capacities that already exist in a longer term sustainable way. And I think there's also a really interesting question of how do you get like smart and capable people that are nationals of their country um, further involved in the civil servants and the civil service and make that kind of a career that's rewarding. So those would be areas that I would kind of further explore on both of those topics. Got it, great, that's everything from me. Should I, yes. Okay, so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, so one audience member asks, if you're using climate change as a cost comparison um, across cause areas, is climate change also worth considering as a cause area itself? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I have this like pretty small paragraph in my thesis right now where I'm like, why isn't climate change on this bracket? And I basically say that I think like the impact is comparable to pandemics based on the research that I saw and climate change is like relatively less neglected in terms of funding. I think there are people that would disagree with that. Like I think some people would say like the tail and risks of climate change are much, much worse than pandemics and I think it could absolutely go on this diagram. I also, the one last thing is, I think there's also just like a bunch of really interesting research to be done in climate change around like what are the most effective levers. There's like a little bit from drawdown that prioritizes interventions, but from a policy perspective, I think that's like a really fruitful question as well. That leads pretty well into our next question, which is what was the response from your colleagues at the Public Policy School on this framework? Were they mostly receptive or did you receive a lot of criticism? Um, uh, I think people were generally receptive. I, um, I think some of the conclusions that I make are judgment calls, like the expert interviews, not everybody you know, agrees with, um, and that kind of affects the tractability. Um, I also think that there's this interesting dynamic, and I saw this more with the Kennedy School Career Group, which is by the time you get to policy school, like some people have already specialized for several years in a particular topic area within global development and um, are open to the intellectual exercise of being able to, to being willing to compare them, but maybe aren't open to the kind of personal um, like relearning or the personal implications of changing between cause areas within the field. Um, and so I think that was kind of one, sometimes I'd have to have conversations being like, Pretending that you were just starting all of this over again, how would you feel about some of these questions? And then finally, did you use a similar four-step process to figure out your own personal <laughs> career path? And if so, where has it led you? Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, honestly, a lot of this was like a personal intellectual exercise for me. I came into the Kennedy School um, kind of believing that the top thing that I could do, especially given my nationality as an American was um, to think about scaling up an evidence-based program um, and uh, kind of had this like pretty large about like um, revision where I uh, where I believe that kind of some of the other paths that I outlined that are top recommended might have been higher impact and so the, the thesis for me was kind of an intellectual journey of like working through that and working through what the 
the implications on my career. Another way to phrase that is like my step one around my impact hierarchy was in flux. And I like came in with a certain version of my impact hierarchy and it changed over the course of the Kennedy School. Um, where that has led me now is I'm uh, taking the meta approach and interested in EA community building. So I think I've uh, opted out of some of the, not opted out, but kind of taken a step away at a higher level um, from some of these things in part because I think a lot of the meta questions are super important um, and I wish more, more folks were focusing on them. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thank Joan and James one more time.